Yes, thank you, thank you. So thank you very much for, for the invitation to speak with you today. Um, I think this is the, the most number of theorists I've ever given this talk to, so I'm really, and I, and I hear you guys ask a lot of questions too, so I'm really looking forward to what you think about the observations that I'll be presenting today. Uh, and also before I start, I wanted to point out that a lot of what I'm going to be discussing can be found in my review chapter from Protostars and Planets 6. And I wanted to point out Jawan Ju, who isn't here yet, but he was a co-author on this. And the, the generally what I'm going to be talking to you about is how do we look for the signatures of planets and disks? What do we think these signatures are? And the reason we do this is because we want to answer one of the big questions in astronomy. How do planets form? So the general picture is that grain growth, well, we have dis dust settling and grain growth in disks. We get large planetesimals that form in the disk midplane. Those coagulate and grow somehow into making planets. And once the planets are big enough, uh, they should start affecting the disk around themselves. And so in order to get a more detailed picture of what are the effects of planets on the disk in which they form, we want to look for the signatures that the planets would leave on a disk. And theory tells us that as a planet is forming, it should accrete and sweep out the material around itself, leaving behind a clearing in the disk. And to date, we have detected many clearings in disks around young stars, many gaps and holes. And we study these objects in the hope that there are planets forming in these disks and that we can extract constraints for theoretical models based on these observations. So there are three main questions that I want to address today. The first is, what evidence do we have for planets forming in disks? So I'll be talking a lot about the transitional disks that were mentioned uh, earlier. Then what can we learn from disks that have holes and gaps about disk evolution in general and also planet forma formation in particular? And then lastly, where do we go from here? So here is where I'm going to be talking about new ALMA results, and I'll be talking a little bit about HL tau. So first, I'll I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's never happened before. Let's see where it went. OK. So let me do this. So oh, yeah, Microsoft decided to quit. So that's my fault. Sorry about that. Oh, boy. OK. Presentation. Back in business, I hope. So sorry about that. That's never happened before. But Microsoft, that's their fault. So three main questions. Yes. And then, so for the to answer the first question, what do we think are the signatures, um, the evidence that we have for planets forming in disks? So about 15 to 20 percent of disks around young stars, they have clearings in the dust distribution. And disks that have gaps, we call those pre-transitional disks. And disks with holes, we call transitional disks. Most disks around T Tauri stars, young, one million year old pre-main sequence stars, we think that they are surrounded by full disks, conventional disks, normal disks, but disks that don't have very large clearings within the dust distribution. So before we understand where the signatures of holes and gaps in disks, first I have to tell you what do we know in general about disks. So I'll start off with an overview of full disks. What do we expect those to look like? And then I'll go into uh, the observational evidence for the holes and the gaps in disks. So this, um, this cartoon does a very good job of summarizing our general knowledge of what we think is happening in these disks around young stars. So very generally, we think that there is dust and gas mixed together in the outer disk. When you get very close to the star and you reach a temperature of about 1,500 Kelvin, it becomes too hot for dust to exist, and so the dust sublimates. And um, so we have an inner edge to the dust distribution of the disk. But gas can exist at hot temperatures, so it goes inward towards the star until it's truncated by the magnetic field lines. And what we think happens is that material loads from the inner gas disk onto the star via these magnetic field lines. And once it hits the stellar surface, it forms a very hot accretion shock, which emits in the UV in the, in the X-ray. And we can see this observationally. 
and um, basically the, the dust and the gas in the disk emit in the, the infrared and the millimeter wavelengths. And I'll go into more detail on that in a few more slides. So there's also a lot of complex chemistry that is expected to occur in these disks, and I will not be touching on that in this presentation. There are also a lot of uh, processes that we think are going on in order to create planetesimals in disks, and I'll be touching a little bit on dust, um, dust settling and dust grain growth. But for most of this presentation, I'll be focusing on what can we learn from the continuum emission from disks around young stars. photon dominated. So this must be referring to the EUV layer in the uppermost part of the disk, where, it's where um, the EUV radiation ionizes the uppermost part of the disk. So um, what evidence do we have for disks around young stars? And I want to start off with looking at spectral energy distributions. So a lot of this work happened in the 80s. And you'll see in these spectral energy distributions, I've, of, I've replaced the mid-infrared photometry, which much higher resolution Spitzer IRS data. And I'll be showing a lot of these um, spectral energy distributions, these sets throughout this presentation. So these are basically plots of lambda F lambda versus wavelength. These in particular are from the U-band out to the millimeter. The observations are in blue. And the emission that you would expect to see for a bare Titari star photosphere is this magenta line here. So you can see in the optical wavelengths, the observations agree with what you expect to see for a bare Titari star photosphere. When you go to the longer wavelengths, you start to see excess emission above the photosphere. And that's coming from dust in a disk around the star. Dust has a high opacity at the short wavelengths, around one micron, where the star emits most of its radiation. And so the disk is a very uh, efficient absorber of the stellar radiation, and it re-emits it at longer wavelengths in the infrared and beyond. So most of the evidence for disks around young stars came in the 80s, looking at broadband SEDs. Then in the 90s, we started getting confirm images confirming the presence of disks around young stars. These are some disks taken with HST in the infrared. You can't actually see the disk itself at these wavelengths. So the disk is this dark lane here. So again, it has high opacity at these wavelengths, so it's absorbing emission. But you can see light which is being scattered off of the surface of the disk. And so with this combination of, and uh, so that combination showed us that there was, there was dust in the disk from the SEDs and from the, the Spitzer image, the HST images. We can also get evidence for accretion of, of gas onto the star when we look at the spectral energy distribution. You can see that there's this excess above the photosphere in the U-band data. So again, that's coming from, we think that's coming from an accretion spot, a hot accretion spot at a temperature of about 10,000 Kelvin. So it emits very strongly as a continuum in the ultraviolet, very bright ultraviolet emission. You can see the excess more clearly for this object when you get um, optical, when you get UV and optical spectra. So the spectra are in green and purple. This black line here is a model of the accretion shock emission on the stellar surface. The actual emission from the accretion shock is the cyan line. This red line is the emission that you expect to see for just uh, a bare Titari star photosphere. So we can explain this excess emission above the stellar photosphere in the ultraviolet at the shorter wavelengths with accretion onto the star. And just to keep this number in the back of your head, the average Titari star accretion rate is measured to be about 10 to negative 8 solar masses per year. And I'll get back to that in a few more slides. So this, this work that happened in the, in the 80s and the 90s, um, in the late 90s, people started to develop models, more sophisticated models, to try to explain the observations. These particular model that I'll be reviewing now and that I use for the, the rest of this presentation are the models of Paola D'Alessio. So these are models of irradiated accretion disks around, uh, solar, uh, around solar mass young pre-main sequence stars. So in the, in the model, we have that the, the temperature in the innermost part of the disk is uh, the hottest at about 1400 Kelvin. As you get further away from the star and also deeper into the disk midplane, it gets, we get down to cooler temperatures. So different parts uh, uh, dominate the sed, the star dominates here, the wall and the infrared, and the outer disk at the longer wavelengths. We also have several input parameters to the code, the outer radius of the disk, the temperature of the star, the radius, the mass, and the accretion rate onto the star. And these are all parameters that we fix based on the observations. The ones that we leave as free parameters when we're fitting the spectral energy distribution with these models is the <coughs> alpha parameter following Sakura and Senyaev, the epsilon 
parameter, which I'll discuss in the next slide, which that measures the amount of dust settling in the disk, and the uh, A max, which is the, the radius, the maximum grain size of the dust that you're measuring, and also the dust composition. So the Delasio models include different kinds of heating in the disk. So we include the stellar radiation from the disk, uh, the stellar radiation from the star affecting the disk around it. We also uh, include the accretion heating from the, uh, the hot spots on the stellar surface and also viscous dissipation in the innermost part of the disk. And we, we solve the, the, the disk structure equations assuming hydrostatic equilibrium. We solve for the temperature, the pressure, and the density in the radial and the vertical direction. So back to this epsilon parameter. So this is how we parameterize the amount of dust settling in the disk. It's the ratio of the, it's the dust to gas mass ratio in the upper layers of the disk relative to the dust to gas mass ratio in the disk midplane. And so if we have an epsilon of one, that means we have no settling. The small dust grains and the large dust grains are well mixed in the disk. If we have a, a small epsilon parameter, that means that you have a very settled disk. So the larger dust grains have settled to the midplane, and so you have in your midplane um, a lot of large grains. Are you making some assumption about dust size distribution? So um, in the next slide, we, we fit for the, the dust size distribution. So the dust composition is a very important ingredient to, to the model. It has a strong effect on the spectral energy distribution that you, you get. So we hold the minimum grain size fixed at 0 0.005 microns following what we see in the, in the ISM. And we'll leave the maximum grain size as a, as a free parameter. And we constrain the maximum grain size, um, the small grain size in the upper layers of the disk using the 10 micron and the 20 micron silicon emission features. And for the dust opacities, we use a mixture of carbon, silicates, and water ice. And uh, of course, this is, uh, even though it's one of the more sophisticated models that we have to fit the data, it's still a relatively sim simplistic model, taking into account all the theoretical expectations for disks. We don't include dead zones. We don't include asymmetries in the disk. We assume that the accretion rate is constant throughout the disk and onto the star, which is not theoretically expected. But I'll, do, I'll, I'll show you how we can do a relatively good job of fitting the observations, even with a simple model like this, and what we've been able to, to back out by comparing the models to the data. So that's your, your very quick introduction to what a full disk looks like. Now let's get into what does a disk with a hole or a gap look like? What are the SEDs that we see and the images we see in the submillimeter and in the millimeter? So before I get started on that, I want to just be clear about the terminology that I'll be using because even within the, the subfield of, of transitional disks, we have a lot of confusion amongst ourselves. What do we call these things? So when I say full disks, I'm referring to something where we haven't detected a large um, clearing of dust yet when we look at the observations. A pre-transitional disk, we, that has a, a gap, an inner optically thick disk separated by a cleared out ring from an outer optically thick disk. So it has an annular gap. And a transitional disk has a hole. So from the, the, the stellar radius out to um, usually tens of AU in these objects, we see a very large depletion in the dust of these disks. And um, in the literature, the, the words cavity or clearing uh, and clearing are used um, interchangeably to describe any kind of clearing that you see in a disk, a gap, or a hole. The inner wall, that's what I use to refer to that, that point in the disk where the dust is sublimated, so the inner edge to the dust distribution in the disk. Transitional disks also have an outer wall, which th is at, um, this is at several tens of AU, this is more at about 0.1 or so AU. And pre-transitional disks have both an inner wall and an outer wall. So now we can go to the observations. What do disks with holes and gaps look like? So a lot of this work happened in the, the first paper that looked at transitional disks in general that came out in 1989 by Strom et al. looking at ground-based uh, mid-infrared photometry. And they saw dips when they looked at the spectral energy distribution. With Spitzer IRS in 2005, we were able to start to get much more detailed observations. So the IRS spectra are in red here. This is a particular transitional disk, Koku Tau 4. And just for comparison, if you were seeing a, a bare Titari photosphere, you'd see a power law like this. If you were seeing a full disk around a Titari star, you'd see um, a spectral energy distribution in the infrared that looks more like, like this. 
And when we look at CoQ tau 4, we see at the short wavelengths, it agrees with we, what you expect to see for a bare T-Tauri star photosphere. But then as you go to longer wavelengths, it agrees with what you see for a full disk. So from that, you can infer that there is a hole in the disk. And um, so with uh, Spitzer IRS, we were able to start uh, uh, doing a lot more detailed modeling of these transitional disks starting in 2005. And Strom et al. coined the term transitional because they believed that these objects were transitioning from a full disk to into a debris disk, and that this was an intermediary phase in between the two. This is the SED for GMRIGI, another very popular transitional disk that you'll see throughout this presentation. The emission from the stellar photosphere is the magenta line. The emission you expect to see for a full disk is this broken, uh, broken line here, which is actually the median spectral energy distribution that you see for young stars in Taurus that have disks. The observations are in blue. And you can see that overall, there is a big deficit of emission relative to what you expect to see from a full disk. So you have a large hole in the disk. But we also have a small amount of near-infrared excess and a strong 10 micron silicate fissure. And we can explain that as coming from optically thin dust distributed very close to the star, ISM-sized optically thin dust. And I was able to reproduce this set using the D'Alessio model, but we have a, a hole in that model and we have some optically thin dust close to the star. And we can reproduce the, the emission with a, a wall located at about a radius of 20 AU. It's that outer wall here that is dominating this rise in the mid-infrared spectrum. And here we have about 10 to negative 12 solar masses of ISM-sized optically thin dust that leads us to, to getting this near-infrared excess and the 10, mi 10 micron silicate emission feature. So at first, a lot of people were very suspicious that we were seeing a lot of these dips based on spectral energy distributions. And uh, a few years after that, we, were, we started getting um, submillimeter imaging confirmation that there were indeed cavities in disks. So nowadays, you take a submillimeter <coughs> image, you expect to see a cavity. But that wasn't the case only a few years ago. So here are, uh, here's an 860 micron image of GMRIGI and a 1.3 millimeter image. If you were seeing a full disk, you would expect to see a centrally peak source, but instead you see a double peak source, and that's due to optical depth effects for a disk that has a hole in it and is inclined along your line of sight. Here in the middle are synthetic images uh, based on this model that I did, and you can see the residuals are very small, and also the fit to the, to the visibilities is also very good. So this was the, the first confirmation of a large cavity in a disk. Um, so basically, I, I fit this and I just created an image. I didn't change anything. So you didn't change anything. You no. Just what you put in the center. Yes. All the parameters were just in the center. Yes. We were very surprised. We thought we would have to iterate a lot. And so did you put the inclination to know to your knowledge? The, so for the inclination, this had been found before by some observations by Dutre et al. looking at CO, CO, li CO lines in the disk. And the, the millimeter images, you can fit a, a Gaussian to them, and GMRIE has an inclination of about 42 degrees. But that, that's something that we can't get from the, the spectral energy distribution. We already had previous observations. So in 2007, using Spitzer IRS, we were able to identify a new type of clearing in disks. So up to this point, 2007, we had a lot of these holes in disks. Then in 2007, we started seeing disks with gaps. So these are the, the pre-transitional disks. They have an inner disk separated by a gap from an outer disk. And the idea in naming the pre-transitional disks is that eventually this inner disk should accrete onto the star on the viscous time scale, and eventually we should be left behind with something that looks like a transitional disk. And, some, and sometimes these, these gaps are empty, like we saw in Koku Tau 4. Sometimes they have some optically thin dust within the gap, like we saw in GMRIG. So this was the first pre-transitional disk, um, UX Tau A. So uh, similar to the transitional disks that have the holes, there is a big deficit of emission here and a rise at the longer end of the IRS spectrum, so telling you that you have a, a big cavity in the disk. But in, in contrast to the transitional disks, they have a very strong near-infrared excess, and it actually agrees with what you expect to see for a full disk. So just by looking at the SED, you can infer you have optically thick material close to the star, a cleared out region, and then optically thick material again as you get further away from the star. 
And I was able to reproduce the stud again by inserting a gap in the, the Del Asio model, in this case, a gap of a radius of about 30 AU in order to explain the emission. And all of this near infrared excess we could explain as coming from the inner wall of the inner disk. In the same paper where we reported the gap in UX Tau A, we also reported a gap in Likhausen 15, which is also now a, a very popular uh, disk to look at. At first, we weren't very sure, does it have a gap or does it have a hole? That's because it has this strong near infrared excess like we saw in UX Tau A, but then it also has a strong 10 micron silicon emission feature like we saw in GMRIB. So we weren't sure, were we seeing optically thin dust within a gap or optically thin dust within a hole? So at the time, we did know that there was a large cavity in the disk based on millimeter imaging. And this has been confirmed recently with much higher resolution data at, uh, taken at the SMA. And even in the near infrared, this beautiful near infrared image from the SEEDS team that shows that there is a, a gap in the disk. So we know that there is a large cavity in the disk of Lycalcium 15, but that doesn't tell us much about the innermost part of the disk. So is there a gap or a hole? You need to probe the innermost part of the disk in order to get that information. And so what we did is we got near-infrared spectra at NASA IRTF. Near-infrared wavelengths trace the, the dust destruction radius in the disk. The lick calcium 15 infrared data, near-infrared data are in red. The emission from a, a weak Titari star of the same spectral type are in black here. And what we did is we subtracted the, the template star from the Lickhausen 15 spectrum, and we're left behind with this emission here, which is the excess emission above the stellar photosphere. And we can fit it with a single temperature black body with a temperature of about 1400 Kelvin. And this is important because if you remember, uh, 1400, 1500 Kelvin, that's the temperature at which we expect that the dust sublimates in the disk. And when we look at um, Mazarol et al. in 2003, they looked with the, the same data at disks that we think are full in the Taurus region. And each of these lines, they use the same, we use the same extraction method as them. Each of these lines corresponds to a single temperature black body, ranging in temperature from 1200 to 1600 Kelvin. So this is a strong that we have optically thick material at the dust destruction radius in these full disks, and Likhausen 15 has very similar emission to the full disks. And so from this, we can deduce that there is an inner optically thick disk in Likhausen 15. And this was the, the first confirmation of a gap in a disk. And of course, people who were looking for planets got very interested in Likhausen 15 because it has a gap that could be due to planets. And this is a potential protoplanet that was identified by um, Adam Krauss and Mike Ireland using Keck. And here is the, this is the submillimeter image of Likhausen 15 I showed you before, but scaled to, to different, uh, a different color scale. When they look inside of the, of the cavity in this disk, about 11 <coughs> AU from the star, they see this. And what they claim is that in blue here, we have a, that's a K-band emission, and we have a, a point source in the K-band. And this red material flanking it is L-band emission. And what they propose is that we have a five Jupiter mass planet in this disk, and that it's still accreting material around itself. And this hasn't been confirmed uh, yet independently by a different group, but um, Adam Krauss has told me that he's followed up with Keck on this object, and they do see that um, it, it moves, it moves they, they have been able to confirm that there is a, a point source there in, in a second follow-up image. So Lickhausen 15 isn't the only candidate um, protoplanet that's been um, found in a disk. There are about a handful more, but I just want to show you one, uh, another one that I think is very promising. So when you look at the, I think that this is a, a K-band image, uh, but this was taken with, uh, at the VLT, and you see this point source here. And the authors propose that this is a, a candidate companion. And it's located within this bright ring that is seen in the near infrared. So this is also another example of, of, of a beautiful bright ring seen in the near infrared. So within this bright ring, there's, there's, a, there's a gap. And then outside here, there's another gap. And if you compare this to the submillimeter image, so here are the submillimeter contours in white overlaid on this near infrared image. You can see that in the submillimeter, you also see a big cavity in, in the grain size, in the grain distribution of this disk. So what the authors propose is that we're detecting a, something like a 20 to 30 Jupiter mass companion in this disk, whether that's a, a very massive planet or a, a brown dwarf is still up for debate. 
But what we do see is evidence for dynamical clearing uh, and sculpting of the disk based on these observations. So up to now, I've been telling you about very specific uh, exemplars, very specific cases of transitional and pre-transitional disks. Now I want to take a step back. Yes. Yes. So that's a good question. So for the, the pre-transitional disks, that inner disk, we measure that it has, a, it, has a, it has a very small extent, so less than half NAU. And the reason for that, we think, is due to observational bias. You're only going to see a big cavity in the, you're only going to see a big dip in the sed when you, have a, when you have an inner disk, if that inner disk is very, very small. So we measure, and, and we measure it based on assuming that the, the properties of the inner disk are the same as the outer disk that we get from the set. So that's a good point. It, it brings up the, the fact that we're limited based on the, the observations. And when I talk about ALMA, um, I'll, I'll revisit that. So yes, do keep in mind that we're here we're just sensitive to the very massive uh, tens of AU wide holes and gaps in disks. So back to taking a step back and seeing the, the properties of transitional and pre-transitional disks in general. So most of these objects are identified looking at colors, so sp mainly Spitzer photometry. That's what we have most data on. So this is a plot of the, the K-band emission minus um, the 5.8 Spitzer IREC band and the K-band um, band, the, the band emission minus the 24 MIPS, uh, MIPS Spitzer band. And if you were looking at a bare Titari star photosphere, you wouldn't see excess emission in either um, in either of these uh, slopes, so your, your objects would be down here. Most objects lie here, and this, um, this is a quartile, which shows the distribution of, of full disks, what the, the colors that we expect for full disks. And what you can see is that the transitional disks are separated out down here. So these are disks that have, they have very little near infrared emission, but then they have uh, excess, but then th as you go to longer wavelengths, they start to pop up, they start to get more excess. And you can also see that the pre-transitional disks lie over here. So it's very hard to extract, to identify a pre-transitional disk just looking at the colors. Because, it, because of that inner disk, it's going to have emission that looks similar to a full disk. So to date, so the, the best way to identify pre-transitional disks is to get Spitzer IRS data. And to date, we've identified about 200 <coughs> disks with holes and gaps using Spitzer IRS data. Of those 200, about 20 or so have been followed up in the submillimeter. This is just a, a, several images taken at the SMA of various transitional and pre-transitional disks. And so, um, so, and so what we're finding more and more is that when you see evidence for a dip in the IRS spectrum, you're going to see uh, evidence for a dip, uh, a cavity also, when you look at the submillimeter or the millimeter. Here, um, it is not reliable because the, it, it doesn't rise above the signal-to-noise ratio, but I will be talking about ALMA images in, towards the end of the presentation where we do see real axisymmetric uh, features in the disk. But with, the, with current uh, SMA and uh, KARMA data, it's very hard to, to say that any of these asymmetries are real. So we don't know that yet. So. Adam Krauss has done a big survey of Taurus looking for binary stars, and that's where a lot of the, the transitional disks are. Um, and he's found that in Taurus, only one of them is a binary, and I'll return to that one in a, in a couple slides. A lot of the transitional disks are also in chameleon, um, where we don't have big binary surveys. So I'll get, I'll get to in a few slides about um, binary companions and how they can also clear the disk. But the, the ones that I'm talking about in this presentation, you, um, GMRIG, UX Tile, Lickesson 15, those have been found to be single stars. So um, of the, the 20 objects that have submillimeter imaging, a smaller subset of those have near infrared imaging. And here in particular, I'm showing some images from the SEEDS collaboration. Um, so in these uh, panels up here, the cavity that's measured in the submillimeter is the broken white line, and the, the black circle just corresponds to the, the resolution limit of the observations. 
And the near-infrared emission is in blue here. So you can see that there are some objects where you see a cavity in the millimeter, but you don't see a cavity in the near-infrared. You still see um, a lot of blue emission coming from, near, coming from small dust grains within the cavity in the submillimeter. But then you do see examples of some objects where there's also a cavity in the near-infrared that agrees with the cavity that we're seeing in the submillimeter. And then there are some disks that are in between where you just see a, a break in the, the radial surface brightness. So Tim can probably answer this better. Yeah, so they, uh, these are usually H-band. Yeah, scattered light emission. So um, later on, when I talk about the mechanisms that have been proposed to explain uh, these cavities and discs, I'll come back to these, these C's results, how can we think we can explain them, this difference between the spatial distribution of the small dust grains and the large dust grains in some cases. And up to now, I've been talking really just about the dust. That's what we're most sensitive to. But what about the gas? Well, most of the transitional and pre-transitional discs are accreting. Here is UV HST cis data taken for GMRIG, the transitional disc I talked about earlier. And just to remind you, this is excess emission in the UV, which we think is coming from an accretion shock on the stellar surface. And we measure an accretion rate for GMRIG of about 10 to negative 8 solar masses per year. So these objects that have very large cavities in the dust distribution still have substantial uh, gas that is making it through somehow from the inner, inner disk through that cavity and onto the star in order for us to measure these very high accretion rates. And a Yes, so it's indirect. So, the, so uh, Laura Engelby, she's a postdoc in my group at Boston University, she takes uh, accretion shock models where they measure the emission that you would expect to see from this accretion shock on the stellar surface, and they can change the size of the, the shock. But it is an indirect method. So you change the size of the accretion spots, the spots of the, on the stellar surface, the size, the density, and to see how much UV emission you can back out. And therefore, that's, and then that's converted to an accretion rate. Um, yes, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So um, it is just from the, the we back out the, lumino the excess luminosity above the stellar surface and turn that into a uh, accretion rate. And there have been some models looking at the, the accretion due to the alpha. And I'll get to that very briefly in a, in a few slides. But there's still a lot of theoretical work that has to be done to explain accretion. What sort of uh, size of spots that we need to consider to explain this uh, effective temperature information for this uh, result? Yeah. I mean, is so it 10% of the accretion rate? Or no, it's, it's nothing like 10%. I can look up the exact numbers for you. I don't know them off the, the, the top of my head. But they're not, um, they don't cover a significant part of the, the stellar surface. Do we have measurements of magnetic fields? For GMRIG, no. Um, I think there is one object, DO tau or DP tau, something that begins with D and is in Taurus, that we have uh, magnetic field measurements for. And that object is accreting. And I can look that, that paper up for you. It escape, escapes me right now. OK, so the main point here is that there is still gas close to the star, even though we have a big depletion of the dust grains. And this isn't only seen in individual objects like GMRIG. When we look at the, when we look at full disks, the accretion rate of full disks versus disks that have holes and gaps, we see this. Dif we also see a, a difference in accretion rates. So, this is a the accretion rate versus the disk mass. The transitional and pre-transitional disks are the crosses, and the full disks are the black dots. And the main point here is that the accretion rates of disks with holes and gaps overall are lower than full disks, but not substantially so. And I followed up this, this study that was done by Najira et al. with about 60 objects. And in this histogram, you see that the full disks over here peak at around uh, 1.3 times 10 to negative 8 solar masses per year. And the transitional and the pre-transitional disks peak around here. So 3.1 times 10 to negative 9 solar masses per year. So overall, the accretion rates of disks with holes and gaps are a little bit lower, but they're not down to the level of about 10 to negative 10 
solar masses per year or so. And again, this is another point that I'll get back to when I talk about trying to resolve the, the gas and the dust properties of these disks when we talk about clearing due to planets. So that's the, the basic introduction to full disks, what do disks with holes and gaps look like. Now I want to take a closer look and start to explore what can we learn from disks that have holes and gaps about disk evolution in general and planet formation in particular. Actually, no, I don't want to do that just yet. I want to first introduce you very quickly to the theoretical mechanisms that have been proposed to explain holes and gaps in disks, and then I'll look in, in more detail. So the first, uh, the first up is, is planet formation, a lot of people's favorite in this field. Planets can clear out the disk around themselves, creating gaps in the disk. And I'll be returning to this in a lot more detail later. But it's important to keep in mind a point that was raised earlier, that uh, a, 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 plan a stellar mass companion can also dynamically clear the disk. And this has been shown by Artumowitz and Lubow. And actually, Koku Tau 4, which is an object I showed you, the first object I showed you, that has, it was the first transitional disk with IRS spectra to be modeled. It has a, a cavity of about 10 AU in radius, and it also has a, uh, a stellar mass companion at a separation of about 8 AU or so. And so it's important to keep in mind that not all of these cavities that we see are due to planets, but I do think that this is strong evidence that the cavities that we're seeing are due to some form of dynamical clearing. Another mechanism that's been proposed to explain the, the holes and gaps in disks is dust grain growth. This is a simulation of letting dust grains grow and evolve in the disk over one million years. You can see that you start to see deficits in the, in the, in the mid-infrared emission in the spectral energy distribution. But when you do this in the submillimeter images, you see that you start with a centrally peak source and you end with a centrally peak source. And neither of this, these agree with the observations. When we look at the SEDs, we see very strong 10 micron silicon emission, and we also see this doubly peaked spatial brightness distribution in the submillimeter. So dust grain growth has been shown not to be able to reproduce the, the large depletions of dust grains that we see in these disks. And the last mechanism I'm going to talk about is photoevaporation. So these young stars have a lot of high energy radiation, X-ray, EUV, FUV. What we think, ha what, what can possibly happen is that this can this can um, heat up the outer layers of the disk to the point where it becomes unbound, and then you get a small gap that forms in the disk, and then the inner disk accretes onto the, the star on a viscous time scale, leaving you behind with a hole in the disk. However, the, the photoevaporation models cannot explain all of the transitional and pre-transitional disks that we see, and this is work that's been done by, by James Owen, who is a, a Hubble Fellow here. Yes, okay, he just got here Monday. So this is a plot of the accretion rate versus the inner hole radius. The, the colored parameter space here is what the photoevaporation models can explain for accretion rates and, and hole size, well, cavity sizes. The points correspond to observations. And you can see that photoevaporation can explain a subset of objects that have lower accretion rates and smaller cavities but they can't explain these objects up here. So these are the ones that I've been talking to you about today, GMRIGI, UX Tau A, Lick Calcium 15. Those have accretion rates that are too high and cavity sizes that are too big to be compatible with photoevaporative clearing. But it is important to keep in mind that a subset of these objects can be explained with photoevaporation. So it doesn't have to be dynamical clearing. So now I will get to going into explaining what do we think we can learn about these, how can we apply these observations of disks with holes and gaps to um, disk evolution and planet formation? I'll be starting off talking about variability in disks. So here are some, here are two IRS spectra taken for UX Tau A. And we can see that the emission seesaws at the shorter wavelengths, the red spectrum is higher than the blue one, and the behavior switches at the longer wavelengths. We see the same thing in Le Calcium 15. The red spectrum is higher at the, in, at the shorter wavelengths. It's lower at the longer wavelengths. But the 10 micron silicon emission stays the same. And these two spectra were taken a week apart. These two spectra were taken about three to four years apart. <coughs> and just to remind you, 
this <coughs> near the short end of the IRS spectrum, that's coming from the inner wall of the disk. The 10 micron silk emission feature is coming from the opsy thin dust within the gap. And the emission here at the longer end of the IRS spectrum is coming from this outer wall. Yes, the spectra is just changing by 20% or so. So we don't, so we don't know yet what exactly is within these holes, these cavities that we see in the, in the set and with current millimeter. Um, maybe with ALMA, we'll see that there is a lot of gas in these gaps. Maybe we'll see that there's a trace amount of small grains in the gas that we're just not sensitive to right now. But based on the, what we have so far, we think that these, these cavities are, there's a very strong deficit of the large dust grains. What's the, f oh, I see. So I would have to, to look that up, but if there, if there is millimeter, if there are millimeter grains within these gaps, it would have to be very, very small trace amounts. Um, so for example, with calcium 15, there was a paper by um, Andrew, uh, Sean Andrews and also Andrea Sella looking in more detail. And what they find, so using um, VLA data, Andrea Sella finds that there is, there is some emission within about four to five AU in millimeter dust grains in the calcium 15, but nothing outside of that until you get to about 40 AU or so. So there is some millimeter um, emission. There are some large dust grains in these disks, but it's close to the star. So getting back to the, the seesaw variability. So how do we explain that? So what I propose to explain that is to take into account that the inner disk in these objects is optically thick, and show it, it should cast a shadow on the outer disk. And in particular, uh, I'm just making the schematic simple, comparing the inner wall to the outer wall. So this inner wall should ca cast a penumbra and an umbra on the outer wall. And so the amount of the, wall, the outer wall that you see is dictated by the height of the inner wall. And you, you can imagine we can explain the infrared variability just by changing the height of this inner wall and therefore changing the amount of shadowing that we see on the outer wall. So when this inner wall is taller, you're going to see more emission from the inner wall. So at the short end of the IRS spectrum, you'll get more emission, but then you'll get a larger shadow on the <coughs> outer wall. So you see less emission from this outer wall. So at the longer end of the IRS spectrum, you see less emission. And I was able to fit each epoch of the observations just by changing this height of the inner wall and therefore changing the shadowing on the outer, the outer wall. And so here the, the bl solid black line is fitting the red spectrum and that corresponds to the case when the inner wall is taller. So you see more emissions at the, at the short wavelengths from this inner wall. You see less emission at the longer end because you see less emission from the outer wall because it's, it's in more of the shadow of the inner wall. What is the, so the wall is located in UX Tau A at about 20 AU radius. The calcium 15, it's at about 40 AU. Height of the wall oh, sorry, sorry. The inner wall is at the dust destruction radius, so that's at about 0.1 AU in these objects. Why is the spatial feature so important in the observation? Yes, so we think that UX Tau A is a relatively empty gap and so that there's no optically thin small dust within the gap. And then we think that Lick Calcium 15 has some ISM sized dust within the gap and it's optically thin. And so it's creating this, this very strong 10 micron feature. Not no, no. So this is, this would be, there's some continuum here from the inner wall. This is from material within the, the gap. So from somewhere out here and we place it at about within 5 AU of the star. And then the other emission is, com this emission here is coming from uh, 40 AU or so. What is the optical depth of this uh, of that? So it's, so I would have to look up the exact number, 
but it's it's uh, it's optically thin. We need it to yes, we need it to be optically thin in order to get this much silicate emission, and it has to be relatively close to a star because it has to be hot in order to create this. So th yeah, that's a good question. So it doesn't vary, and we can't explain that. So why would the, the optically thin dust within the gap not vary? So maybe it's d distributed in such a way that it doesn't fall within the shadow. So, so yes, so I can explain each epoch just by changing the height of the, of the inner wall and changing the shadowing on the outer wall. UX tau A is one week, Lick Housing 15 is three to four years. So in this sample, I had 12, no, I had 14 objects, and the first epic of the observations was Spitzer GTO data, and then my observations came in the last uh, year of the IRS being active, and that was about four to five years after, and then I took two spectra separated by a year. So I have three epics here. I don't show the one that, was, um, that didn't change. So these changes are about 10 to 15 percent, uh, 10 to 20 percent. It depends on the objects in the sample. So these are just the, the two I picked out because um, I've, I've talked to them about you before. But there are also eight other pre-transitional disks that have similar variabilities. Some of them, it's, it's more, the change is more. But all the pre-transitional disks in the sample vary in this way, see saw variability. And there's also been work by uh, Kevin Flaherty, who's at Wesleyan right now. Um, and he's also found in his sample of about 10 disks or so that they see seesaw variability. So that's the observations. What about the theory? Why is the height of, why is this inner wall changing? So it could be due to, to various things. Uh, Flarry et al., they propose that maybe there's, there are hot Jupiters in these disks. This could explain one week variability, whereas if this hot Jupiter is inclined with respect to the disk, it could drag the inner edge of the disk in and out of the plane with it. Um, to explain variability on longer time scales, it could be due that the planet further out in the disk and it excites spiral density waves, which then perturb the height of the inner disk. Also, there's been some, some more recent work um, saying that it could be due to turbulence from the MRI. So turbulence uh, from the MRI can also cause the, the height of the, the inner <laughs> disk to change by about 10 to 20 percent, so what we see in the observations. So um, there has to be more theoretical work to try to explain how do we get this, this inner wall changes? What are the time scales? Um, do they agree with what we see in the observations? There's also a lot of observational work that we still have to do. So ideally, we'd be able to follow these up with um, JWST, which is going to have very similar wavelength coverage to IRS. But before, before we, and, and we can do that at higher cadence, and that's something I, I, I hope to do. But before then, there are also other ways that we can try to test this variability that we see in the pre-transitional disks. So this is a paper that appeared on Astro PH this morning. And the simulations are on the left. Um, yes, the simulations are on the left, and the convolved synthetic images are on the right. This is in the near infrared. And this is an example of a disk where there is material within the gap. There's an inner disk, and it casts a shadow on the outer, on the outer disk. And this is a case where you don't get such sh shadowing. And when you convolve that with the resolution that we have accessible to us today, you can see that when you have shadowing on the outer part of the disk, you're not going to be able to resolve that. But you'll see that the, the star appears to be offset from the, from, the, from the cavity that you measure. Whereas in the case where there isn't, um, there isn't a shadow on the outer disk, you should get that the, the gap is roughly um, centered on the star. And so it would be great to get these kind of observations for all of the, the 10 pre-transitional disks in our sample on a finer cadence and see if we can see changes as the size of the shadow changes uh, on the, um, the, the offset between the star and the gap. So there has been some preliminary work on this. So earlier I showed you this, this image of Lick Housing 15 from the SEEDS team. So what they find is they, they do a model with no shadowing, synthetic image here, and with shadowing. And they, they state that their image here is more similar to the case where there's no shadow than the case where there is shadow. 
So they claim that there isn't a shadow on the outer wall, and so the inner disk has to be inclined in such a way that it wouldn't cast a shadow on the outer wall. So there's still a lot of work that needs to be done observationally and also with our models. So the models that I'm using are very simplistic. We assume vertical walls and that everything is in the same plane. And in the models that they use in Thalman et al., in order to fit the set, they still need to use an optically thick inner disk, like, uh, like I showed it previously. But in order to fit the observations, they need a, a razor thin inner disk, which is not in hydrostatic equilibrium. So it's, there's still a lot of work that we need to do to make progress on this. But I do think that this is um, very interesting, and it's giving us some insight into the short, what happens in disk on short time scales. So that was variability that we saw in pre-transitional disks. What about transitional disks, the ones that have the holes? So here is variability that we saw in GMRIG. So here we see that the variability occurs mainly in the near-infrared emission and the 10 micron silicate emission. And that is coming, again, from optically thin dust within this gap. And um, so um, we decided to follow this up by looking at HST, uh, getting HST data, which traces the shorter wavelengths, the UV emission, to see if there's a correlation between the change in the near-infrared, which is tracing the dust, and the ultraviolet, which is tracing accretion onto the star. And here are the data. This, this project is being led by Laura Ingleby, who's um, a postdoc in my group. The, these are three epochs of HST data, and then at one micron, we, we add in NASA IRTF specs data, so the similar data that I showed you before. And these data were taken on the same day. The, the black spectrum is the first epoch of the observations. The blue spectrum was taken a week after the, the first, and this red spectrum here <coughs> was taken four months after the, the blue one. So we don't see a big change between the first two epochs, but after four months, we do see a significant change at all wavelengths. Um, and you can see that change much more clearly in the, in the, in the, near, in the near UV. And just to remind you, in the, the near ultraviolet, we're tracing the emission from the secretion shock. And in the near, um, the near, the near infrared, we're tracing the dust in the optically thin, the optically thin dust that's close to the star. In order to explain what is causing this variability, we subtracted the, the third epoch from the first epoch, and we were left behind with this excess emission. And we can fit it with this red line, which is the emission above the, which is the, the combination of emission from accretion shock on the stellar surface, and also the obsolete thin dust within the disk. And what we see is that the mass of the dust in the inner disk decreases, and the accretion rate that we measure decreases. At the same time, we see some changes in the far ultraviolet. So this emission here is due to, H, is due to H2 emission, not the accretion shock on the stellar surface. And um, we see that in the first epoch, we have an excess of this feature here at 1,600 angstroms. This feature was identified by Bergen et al. as collisionally, as due to um, its H2 emission due to collisional excitation by X-ray radiation of metals in the disk, which then um, excite the, the H2 to higher levels. And as it cascades down, we get this um, H2 bump. So from this, we're seeing, since this is tracing the H2 emission in the disk, we also see that the gas density, the H2 gas density, decreases over a four-month period. And you have to keep in, in, in mind that four months is, is um, comparable to the orbital time scale close to the star. And so what we propose is happening is that we have inhomogeneities in the inner disk. And that's affecting the, the observations that we see. So these in, so inhomogeneities in the inner disk have been shown. If you have planets forming in this, you should have clumpy material and streamers. Um, this is happening, of course, at a much larger scale in these simulations. We're looking very close to the star. Down to, down to about the dust destruction radius. And what we think is happening is that there's a part of the disk that is less dense, and it rotates in, into our view. And because we're measuring a less dense part of the disk, we get that we have a lower dust mass, and also that we have a lower H2 gas density. Then we think that this could be affecting the amount of mass that is loading onto the star. So the interaction between the star and the disk is very, very complex. This uh, kind of work has been spearheaded by Romanova at Cornell. And what they find, so this is just a schematic showing you that 
So in red, we have the magnetic field lines, and the different colors correspond to different densities. But uh, accretion is a very, very messy process. And the density of the, the accretion columns onto the surf stellar surface can change. And we propose that this is due to perhaps there's a, a less dense part of the disk, and therefore, there's also a, a magnetic field line that's rotating into our view that is accreting material from this less dense part of the disk. And that's what leads us to a lower accretion rate. So you have to remember, when you measure an accretion rate onto a Titari star, we're not measuring the global accretion rate onto the star. We're really just measuring the emission from the hot spot that we see that's along our line of sight. So um, in order to, to, to follow this up in more detail, I've put in a proposal with uh, a joint proposal, HST and Spitzer, to follow up this object and see if we can, we can catch this variability happening again. And there is a, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in trying to understand the star disconnection. We're talking about very small scales. And unfortunately, right now, the best way we can trust, trace that is with these, these spectra, HST and near-infrared spectra. ALMA is not going to be able to access this region. Uh, and also, even in the mid-infrared, we can only access Herbig's, which are very massive stars. And it's thought that maybe the accretion in those objects occurs on a very different um, with very different processes than these, these low-mass Titari stars. And then I want to talk about, so that's variab variability and how we, it affects the disk. What about the spatial distributions of dust and gas in the disk? So, and so the, the two main things that we have to explain for the transitional and pre-transitional pre disks is the sizes of the cavities. So we have cavities that are tens of AU in radius. We also have very high accretion rates, relatively high accretion rates. And just to remind you, the average accretion rate for a full disk is about 10 to negative 8 solar masses per year. So whatever is doing a very good job of clearing out the dust in the disk is not doing a good job of clearing out the gas in the disk. And this is uh, work that's been done by, by Zhao Wanju, who is here trying to explain um, how can you reconcile this? How can you get high accretion rates onto the star and very large cavities in disks? So first, he started out with uh, one planet in a disk. The gap was too small. And the, the accretion rates that were measured onto the star were, were what we would expect on the stellar surface. But the, the gap is too small, the gap in the dust. Then he tried multiple planets in a disk, four Jupiter mass planets in the disk. You get very big cavities in the disk. But when you look at the accretion rates, um, you, there's, a, there's a problem. So this is a plot of surface density versus radius. These upper lines here, the gaps are not deep enough for us to see them in the spectral energy distribution. This gap down here is optically thin. But when you look at the accretion rate, there's a problem. In this case, where you can actually see the gap in the sed, you get that the accretion rate is too low, 10 to negative 11 solar masses per year. So with ga big gaps, you get too much depletion of gas. And so it doesn't explain all the observations. So, um, you can explain large gaps with multiple planets, but not the accretion rate onto the star. So another thing that was tried was including filtration into the, the models. So the way this, this works is that the, the wall acts as a filter. Large grains stay back in the outer disk. Small dust grains and gas filter in through into the inner disk. This is the expectation that you expect to see for the gas and the small dust distribution in the disk. And you see that in the millimeter grains, you get a very large cavity in the disk. So we can explain the accretion rates, we can explain the some millimeter images, but we can't explain the SEDs. Because if you had this much small dust in the inner disk, you would expect to see something that looked like a full disk. But that may not be a problem because we are seeing a subset of disks that look like they're full in the spectral energy distribution, but in the submillimeter, they have cavities. And also, this goes back to the, the seeds image that I showed you before, where you have a cavity in the submillimeter, but there is no cavity in the small dust grains. So maybe these disks are actually in the early stages of dust filtration. And ALMA should be, be able to give us a much better view of how many disks that we think are full actually have gaps within them. And talking about ALMA, where do we go from here? And there are two main things that I think ALMA is really going to change for the field. First, we're going to get a lot more disks with cavities. And also, we're going to get different kinds of cavities as we can spatially resolve the structure of these disks. So most disks are, most of the disks that have cavities around these young stars, they are very bright in the submillimeter. One in five of the bright submillimeter disks has a large cavity in them. 
Recently, I, I observed the two faintest transitional disks that we could possibly get with current observatories at the SMA. And what I found is that these disks lie here in this distribution of brightness. And so this, can, this could be uh, hinting at us that there is a population of disks with large cavities down here that we just haven't been sensitive to. With, and ALMA will be able to, to fully probe this and see how many lower mass, least, less massive millimeter disks have cavities in them. And then ALMA has been giving us, uh, this relates to a question that was asked earlier, has been giving us evidence for a lot of asymmetries in disks. This is an example of IRS 48. This is the millimeter emission from ALMA. It's very lopsided on one side of the star. For comparison, I have here the, the micron sized dust. So the micron sized dust is evenly distributed around the star, but the millimeter dust is lopsided. And what the authors propose is that you have um, this dust filtration effect that I talked about earlier, but happening on a much smaller scale. And so it creates a, a vortex in the disk where the large dust grains get trapped and the small dust grains and the gas uh, filter through. And there have been some, some other examples of these asymmetries in disks. These are a factor of two. The one I showed before was a factor of about 100. Um, so it seems that this may not be a, it, it seems that as we look at these disks in more detail with, with ALMA, we are starting to parse out and see asymmetries in the disk. And uh, Zhao Wang Zhu and, and James Stone have looked at this using MHD models. And um, what they find is here we have the, the gas distribution in the disk and the, the relative change, uh, comparing the, the dust surface density to the gas surface density for different grain sizes. And they look at the effect of having turbulence in the disk and having no turbulence in the disk. And in the case where you have no turbulence in the disk, as you get to a grain size of about 0.3 millimeters, a vortex can form in the disk. As you get a longer, uh, bigger sizes, the dust becomes uh, decoupled. So this feature goes away. And they, this is their, their uh, simulated image based on this, this observation, this uh, simulation here. They convolve it to the ALMA beam and they compare it to the, the Van der Merel, the, 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 the millimeter image that I showed you earlier, but scaled here to actually show the, the contours. So they can explain these big vortices and disks with um, having disks that are not very turbulent. So this is a lot of, um, this is uh, almost gonna do a lot of work in this field in, in helping us better understand these asymmetries. And then of course, I can't go away without talking about this. So here I used to have a slide saying, we're gonna see much smaller gaps with, with ALMA. Now I can say, yes, I told you so. But, um, so this is HL tau, and um, you can see here multiple gaps. And these are gaps that cannot be, um, we can't get them from looking at um, the spectral energy distribution. So what this could be telling us is that there are a lot of gaps in disks that we just don't know about yet. And maybe when ALMA starts to do very big surveys looking at entire regions, we'll start to see that a lot of the disks that we thought were full are actually, actually have multiple gaps, like, like HL tau here. HL tau is also very puzzling because it's a very young system. It's, um, it's still enveloped in its cloud. It has a very strong outflow. And so this wasn't expected at all when they were peering through um, the, the, the envelope to see what was in the middle. So very surprising that perhaps planet formation is accounting for these gaps and is happening at a very young age. And these data um, will not be made public until January or February, but that will not stop theorists. And this is a paper that ap appeared on Astro PH this morning. Um, uh, Zhao Wanju is, is, is a co-author on that. In blue here are the simulations of, of using um, Zhao Wan's um, uh, model with dust filtration. Here is gas, but I want to draw your attention to, to here, where you can see that they have 3.2 Jupiter mass planets in the disk and each of them forms a very deep gap in the disk, in the millimeter distribution of the disk. And you s can start to see something that resembles HL tau. So it's very possible that these gaps that we're seeing in HL tau are due to multiple planets in disks. But stay tuned, I'm sure that when the data come out in January, February, we'll be seeing a lot more um, uh, papers once we can actually touch the data. And the next frontier, I think, in this field is circumplanetary disks. We expect that very massive planets should have accretion disks around themselves. Unfortunately, ALMA will not really be able to probe this very well. So this is the best it can do, looking at about 50 parsecs at an accretion disk around a, 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 a massive protoplanet. Uh, most of this work can be done in the mid-infrared and the near-infrared, so with VLT sphere, and maybe we'll be hearing more about this with, with GPI.
And just to conclude, um, there, I just want to walk through the different kinds of disks that we've seen so far and see, could it be due to a possible evolutionary scenario? So maybe we start out with full disks with very small planets. Those planets grow. They start to make multiple gaps in disks. Maybe once the planets uh, get even bigger, they can clear out more of the material around themselves. And then we can, um, we can imagine that this inner disk has to eventually accrete onto the star and leave, leave us behind with a hole. But maybe this isn't an evolution at all. Maybe just each different kind of disk that we've seen so far just represents a different kind of planetary system with different masses and different amounts of planets. So this is really almost going to do a lot to really advance our understanding of how do disks evolve and do they change um, in between these different stages. So uh, to conclude, in Protostars and Planets uh, 5, five years ago, there were two paragraphs on transitional disks. Protostars and Planets 6, there was an entire chapter. So I'm very excited to see what's going to happen in five more years, especially with ALMA. And I usually end on this cartoon drawing of a gap in a disk. But now I can end with, with this one. So thank you very much. <laughs>